Hey there, it's Kathy. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to History of the 90s early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. When someone suggested that Nickelodeon should create a game show for its young viewers, network executives gathered a bunch of staffers in an office for a brainstorming session. Everyone was invited, from secretaries to writers. No one was considered more important. All ideas were on the table. The only rules for the show, make it so kids could play along at home and make sure there was something at stake so young viewers would care about what they were watching. In the meeting, someone threw out the idea of making the show like the board game Mousetrap, but instead of a ball, it would be a person. From there, the hugely popular game show Double Dare was born, and a revolution in TV programming for kids was set in motion. I'm Kathy Kinzora, and this is History of the 90s, a podcast about a decade that changed the world. On today's episode, Nickelodeon's Golden Age. Nickelodeon was the first cable channel dedicated entirely to kids. But prior to being known for green slime and orange splats, the network was more about education than fun. Before we talk about Nickelodeon's golden age, an era that roughly spans from 1983 to 1995, let's go back to the very beginning. The genesis for Nickelodeon occurred in December 1977, when Warner Cable launched a show called Pinwheel on an experimental cable system in Columbus, Ohio. Pinwheel was the brainchild of Dr. Vivian Horner, who'd been the director of research for the classic PBS kids series, The Electric Company. Essentially, Pinwheel was a Sesame Street knockoff. Lots of puppets, a few humans, and a catchy theme song. Pinwheel, pinwheel, spinning around. Look through my pinwheel and see what I found. Pinwheel, pinwheel, where have you been? Hello, how are you? And may I come in? Pinwheel aired for five hours a day on the commercial-free kids' educational channel, which was also called Pinwheel. And the concept was successful enough that two years later, in April 1979, it expanded nationwide and was rebranded as Nickelodeon. According to Matthew Clickstein, author of Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's golden age, the early Nickelodeon was considered a lost leader for then-parent company Warner Cable. Because they were basically using it to try to attract families into getting their fuller package, Warner's was with Movie Channel and that started to grow as well, they didn't really care about the programming on the channel. In fact, they were making it more specifically to get awards and to get praise from people like Peggy Sharon, who ran an agency that would dealt with parents watching TV and kind of determining what was good for kids or not. So they made it very purposely educational and purposely kind of speaking down to the children. They were really creating it as something that they could pitch as this award-winning educational channel that the families would like, but that kids maybe weren't that interested in because they didn't really care. They just wanted kind of that gloss on it. So there were all these early shows that kind of came and went that nobody's really heard of. Some of those early shows included Columbus Goes Bananas, which eventually became America Goes Bananas, Stand By, Lights, Camera, Action, a movie show hosted by Leonard Nimoy, a.k.a. Spock, on Star Trek, and a show about roller coasters called Wild Ride, starring a young, up-and-coming 80s movie star. Hi, I'm Matt Dillon, and I really dig roller coasters. I can still remember my first ride. I, I guess I was six or seven. I was on the Dragon Coaster at Playland in Rye Beach, New York. Matthew Clickstein says in the early days, the channel was pretty desperate for content. So there were also a lot of weird animated shows licensed cheaply from Eastern Europe. In 1982, still on the hunt for affordable content, Nickelodeon picked up a Canadian show that had already been airing on Ottawa's CJOH TV for a couple of years. Jaws eats Jacques Cousteau will not be shown at this time in order that we may bring you the following special program devoted to bathroom humor. Hey, Moose. Yeah, Randy? Do you want to buy a very rare television set? Mm, what's so rare about it? This set used to belong to Sir John A. Macdonald. Oh, right. They didn't even have television in those days. That's what makes it so rare. 
You Can't Do That on Television was a low-budget variety show with comedy skits featuring mostly kids, music videos, and live call-in contests for viewers. Initially, when Nickelodeon picked up the show, they simply aired repackaged reruns. But they soon discovered their young viewers loved it. So the network decided to partner up with CJOH to make new episodes that took the show up several notches. That meant no more disco dancers or performances by aging Canadian rock bands like Trooper and Max Webster. But they did keep something from the original show, something that would become synonymous with Nickelodeon. But, Alistair, like, what else could there be in that green stuff? Well, I don't know. See, that's why I'm (laughs) coming If you're not familiar with You Can't Do That on Television, every time someone on the show said, I don't know, they got slimed, which means a bunch of chunky green liquid would fall from above, splashing over their head, face, and body. In the scene you just heard, Canadian actor Alistair Gillis was trying to use science to figure out what slime was made of. Not sure if he ever got there, but I can tell you now that slime was made of gelatin powder, oatmeal, and water, with some baby shampoo added to the mix to make it wash out of hair better, which was pretty thoughtful, I guess. Despite being paid an extra $150 every time they got slimed, cast members apparently hated it, especially the show's popular kid host, Christine Moose McGlade. Although unpopular with the cast, the viewers loved it, so much that in 1984, Nickelodeon held its first slime-in contest. The winner got a trip to the set of You Can't Do That on Television to get slimed, of course. All you gotta do is watch new episodes if you can't do that on television all next week and say hello to the future of slime. When you see the slime in address, send in a postcard and you can win a chance to say, (laughs) you know, be a part of slime history. And yes, I must mention that one of Canada's favorite alt-rockers from the 90s, Alanis Morissette, appeared in five episodes of You Can't Do That on Television in 1986, when she was just 12 years old. Long before she was screaming you ought to know to a hated ex-boyfriend, Alanis was trying to avoid getting slimed. Thanks to that green goo and the funny kid-friendly skits and gross-out jokes, You Can't Do That on Television was a big hit for Nickelodeon. But the network's ratings overall were still pretty dismal, and they were losing money. If Nickelodeon was going to stick around, it was make-or-break time. And thanks to a visionary new leader, the network would not only stick around it would embark on a golden age of programming. In 1983, Nickelodeon, heavily in debt, began to take corporate underwriting. Shortly after, the network bit the bullet and accepted advertising. Nickelodeon also began to shed its earlier image as a parent-approved channel. When Geraldine Laybourne took over, everything changed. Forget the boring educational shows that won awards in the praise of parents. What is now called the green vegetable era was over. It was time for dessert. Laybourne wanted shows that kids would like, shows that wouldn't talk down to them or teach them anything. She just wanted stuff that was fun. So Laybourne started building a team that had the same vision. And they were actually, I don't want to say anti-education, but a lot of them told me that, you know, look, if kids want to get educated or families want to get the kids educated, there was PBS or there was you know, certain movies or Sesame Street or Electric Company or whatnot. It was like, they wanted to stand out. It's like, no, no, this is where you can rest, relax, have fun, get messy, you know, be silly. They really wanted to be, again, not necessarily anti-education, but just not educational. They wanted to just be fun. And so that also was a big deal, though, because not only do kids love that kind of stuff anyway, but it helped them in the market to really stand out. We're not PBS. We're not, you know, Sesame Street. We're not Mr. Rogers. We uh, are Nickelodeon. And that really helped them also with the branding. And that was important, too. Seems kind of obvious, but Jerry Laybourne and her team also started talking to kids about what they wanted to watch. It was the first time that focus groups involving kids were held about TV programming. Whether it was the early Mickey Mouse Club or Captain Kangaroo or Bozo the Clown or even things like Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers... It was either, you know, just adults in the room who were figuring out what are kids going to want, what are kids going to like, advertisers, educational experts, but nobody was really talking to the children and seeing what the kids wanted. And there's a very good reason for that. 
because it wasn't until the 80s that you started having more latchkey kids and you had kids who were watching TV by themselves and had control over the remote. Behind the scenes, some other changes were happening. Warner had spun off MTV and Nickelodeon into a newly formed subsidiary called MTV Networks, and a rebranding of the kids' channel to match its new anti-adult image began. The original logo showed a man in a bowler hat looking into a coin-operated movie machine called a Nickelodeon. But seriously, unless you were alive in 1910, how would you even know what that was? Anyway, the logo was updated a couple years later with rainbow letters over a silver pinball. Then, in 1984, the guys responsible for MTV's rock and roll branding were put in charge of updating Nickelodeon's look. And what they came up with was this catchy jingle and the iconic orange splat logo that could morph into anything. A foot, a cloud, a dinosaur, or a lightning bolt. A year later, in 1985, Nickelodeon launched a new nighttime programming block called Nick at Night. Starting at 8 p.m., the channel ran a succession of vintage 60s sitcoms from Donna Reed to Mr. Ed that lured baby boomers and their kids to the channel. Many kids who grew up in this era have some pretty special memories of watching old black and white programs like I Love Lucy, Dick Van Dyke, and The Andy Griffith Show with mom or dad before bed. That same year, entertainment conglomerate Viacom purchased MTV Networks from Warner. And under Viacom, the network started focusing more on making money and investing in original programming instead of just repurposing old shows and licensing existing characters. What followed over the next 10 years was an explosion of innovative, fun, kid-focused programs in every category. Cartoons, live action, variety, and game shows. I'm going to take a look at each of those types of programs, but let's start first with game shows. When Nickelodeon started making original programming, budgets were still pretty tight. A game show, which would be cheap and easy to produce, seemed like the obvious place to start. The first show they came up with was an instant hit. On your mark, get set, go! The first of these two teams to make a mummy out of their partner with a roll of toilet paper will win 20 bucks and control of the most daringly different show on television, Double Dare. Double Dare, which was credited with putting the network on the map, pitted teams of kids against each other in a series of trivia questions and wacky physical challenges, all in an effort to make it to a sloppy obstacle course finale. Focus groups had told Nickelodeon and executives that kids lived vicariously through their parents, watching Price is Right and Wheel of Fortune, because they didn't have a game show of their own. So Nickelodeon set out to create a version with kids in mind. On Double Dare, teams that made it to the obstacle course at the end had to complete eight rapid-fire physical challenges. Everything from pulling a flag out of a giant nose covered in green slime boogers to running through the one-ton human hamster wheel. It was TV magic. Here's Matthew Clickstein. You are hardwiring fun and entertainment into an entire generation of kids. And that is obviously, I mean, I'll even admit, I was one of probably many who, I didn't really watch the Q, you know, the, the trivia uh, aspect. I would kind of wait, I'd sort of flip around until the obstacle course came on because that was what I really watched Double Dare for. And I know a lot of other people did the same thing. Other physical challenges involving food were also hugely popular with viewers. Who couldn't resist seeing someone get chocolate syrup or orange juice dumped on their head? Food was such a big part of Double Dare that in 1987, the New York Times asked a show staffer to calculate the amount of food used during a typical taping. According to their tally, 50 gallons of whipped cream, 30 gallons of slime, dozens of eggs, and 100 cubic feet of popcorn were used. To offset concerns over food waste, production used as much past-dated canned material or other expired goods as possible, which apparently made things kind of smelly on set. Matthew Clickstein says it wasn't just the slimy gack and ridiculous stunts that appealed to kids who watched Double Dare. He says host Mark Summers was also a big part of the show's success. He was such a perfect host and such a perfect 
um, kind of uh, identity for Nickelodeon at the time. He wasn't too old, but he wasn't too young. So there was this nice kind of seemed sort of like an older brother, very avuncular, if anything else. The original show ran from 1986 to 1993 and taped more than 500 episodes. It was so popular that there were spin-off shows like Family Double Dare and Super Sloppy Double Dare. Nickelodeon also partnered with Mattel to release a number of tie-in products, including a board game and the quintessential 90s toy called Gak, which was basically slime in a splat-shaped container. Ironically, crew members on the show were the first to come up with the name Gak for the obstacle course slime. And although the word is also slang for heroin, neither Nickelodeon or Mattel seemed to mind. Other Nickelodeon toys released in the 90s included a Gak Vac and a Gak Inflator. But believe it or not, Nickelodeon and executive Jerry Laybourne didn't want Double Dare or the network to be a total sellout. Legend has it, Nickelodeon turned down a $1 million offer by Casio to be the official time clock of the show. And according to Mark Summers, the network also refused a $1 million license deal to make Double Dare cereal. Summers regularly took the show on the road, including a 100-city live tour in 1993, where he drew thousands of fans of all ages who dreamed of having their face dunked in a giant bowl of whipped cream for a chance to win a Double Dare t-shirt. Double Dare was undoubtedly the most popular game show on Nickelodeon back in the day. But there were many other memorable shows that pitted kids against each other in a variety of wacky and fun ways, including Nick Arcade, Wild and Crazy Kids, Guts, and Legends of the Hidden Temple. Participating in a Nickelodeon game show, or at least being in the audience, was a dream for a whole generation of kids who, if lucky enough, made a family trip to Orlando to visit Nickelodeon Studios at Universal Studios. Beginning in 1990, the Orlando Studios were the epicenter for the network, which had previously been located in New York. Orlando was where many game shows, including Double Dare and other programs like the sitcom Clarissa Explains It All, and the hugely popular variety show All That were filmed in front of a live studio audience. There were also behind-the-scenes tours of the huge complex, which was a pretty mind-blowing experience for kids who spent much of their free time watching Nickelodeon. You see, by 1990, Nickelodeon was being watched in 52 million households across the U.S., to put that in perspective, more kids were watching children's shows on Nickelodeon than all other three major networks combined. And many of the Nickelodeon shows were shown on networks around the world, including Canada's YTV. Chris Morgan, author of the book The Nickelodeon 90s, was one of those kids tuning into Nickelodeon. I watched so much TV when I was a kid, I would in the summers, try and stay up all night surreptitiously in my bedroom watching TV, watching Nick at night, watching old Nick and, you know, classic sitcoms. And yeah, just, I, sometimes I wonder how I had, like, the time. Like, I think, like, I went to school. I played, like, hockey. I hung out with friends of mine. I was outside. I remember being outside a whole bunch, but I also remember watching so much TV. And I just, like, I just feel like, I feel like the days must have been, like, 40 hours back then or something. I couldn't have possibly been only 24 hours. I feel like the 90s was, like, the, maybe the best time to grow up as a TV lover because there was more options than there had been in previous generations because of cable. And there was still, you know, not the stress and fretting about, you know, how much time your kids watching TV. And also because of Nickelodeon, which was the quintessential network for children in the 90s. And it was like so influential. And like, you know, it's not going to probably be like that ever again for any generation. A New York Times article in October 1990 described Nickelodeon's climb to the top this way. What began as an earnest, all-but-invisible non-commercial network 11 years ago has evolved into a kid's icon with a sassy voice and an attitude that is just as distinctive as the one that made MTV such a hit. I mentioned that the variety show All That was filmed in front of a live audience at Nickelodeon Studios, Well, this show was hugely popular. It was a sketch comedy program, which was essentially a kid's version of Saturday Night Live, and it ran for an impressive 10 seasons, beginning in April 1994. It was created by Brian Robbins and Mike Tolan and spawned a number of spin-offs, including Good Burger, Keenan and Kel, and The Amanda Show. 
It also launched the careers of Kenan Thompson, Amanda Bynes, and Nick Cannon. Unfortunately, all that is also connected to the now-disgraced producer Dan Schneider, who was head writer and showrunner. But that aside, the show is remembered for hilarious skits like Ask Ashley, Repairman, and The Loud Librarian. Excuse me, can you please keep it down a bit? Quiet! This is a library! But you're the one making all the noise. It's also remembered, though, for its diversity. The original cast included four girls and three boys. Three of the performers were white, while four were of color. All That's producers knew its audience would be diverse, too, and they embraced that fact wholeheartedly. The opening credits were scored with an original song by TLC, and weekly musical guests were a diverse mix of pop, alternative, R&B, and hip-hop acts, including Aaliyah, Coolio, Erica Badu, Missy Elliott, Bare Naked Ladies, and NSYNC. So we know that game shows and variety shows were a big hit on the network. But there were also some very popular scripted live-action shows on Nickelodeon. The first one was launched in July 1989. Hey, dude. It's a little Hey, Dude followed the owner of an Arizona dude ranch and the teens who worked there for the summer. The show ran for 65 episodes over two years and was split up into five seasons. And even though it was a pretty low-budget and goofy show, it was loved by many and basically helped define Nick's programming for the next 25 years. It also launched the careers of two 90s teen semi-stars, Christine Taylor, who played bubbly girl next door Melody Hansen, and David Lasher, who portrayed lovable troublemaker Ted McGriff. Christine Taylor went on to star as Marsha in the Brady Bunch reboot films and married Ben Stiller, while David Lasher went on to play Josh on Sabrina the Teenage Witch. In recent years, Hey Dude has become a cult classic, not just for kids who grew up on the show, but also for new fans thanks to reruns, DVDs, and of course the internet. Another favorite from that era made history by being the first Nick show with a female lead. Clarissa Explains It All, starring Melissa Joan Hart, debuted in March 1991 and would go on to become one of the biggest hits for the network. It was equally popular among boys and girls, which defied industry beliefs at the time that a show starring a female lead could not attract male viewers. Created by Mitchell Kriegman, who previously worked on both Saturday Night Live and Sesame Street, it was about a strong, quirky, and precocious young girl named Clarissa Darling who had a pet alligator and a best friend named Sam who used a ladder to climb through her bedroom window when he popped by for a visit. And like its main character, the show also did things differently. Clarissa would often break the fourth wall and talk directly to the audience and explain the storylines with fake news segments, graphics, and video games. Clarissa was also a bit of a 90s fashion icon, thanks to costume designer Lisa Lederer, who favored mismatched patterns and bold colors for an eclectic look that was soon imitated by teen girls who watched the show. In 2014, Melissa Joan Hart told Elle magazine that she saved every single piece that she wore on that show and has them stashed away in a basement closet. As for Clarissa's bedroom, where much of the show took place, initially it was done in all pink and was very frilly. But Creekman says he had the set designers literally take black car paint and make checkered walls on top of the pink wallpaper. Clarissa Explains It All initially aired on Sunday nights, but in 1992, it moved to the Saturday night primetime block on Nickelodeon called SNCC which ran from 8 to 10 p.m. and included another popular show called Are You Afraid of the Dark? For 90s kids, the anthology series is remembered as one of the scariest shows of all time. Are You Afraid of the Dark focused on a group of young friends called the Midnight Society who told each other ghost stories. The show had plenty of now-famous guest stars, including Ryan Gosling. 
As for Clarissa Explains It All, it ended its run in 1994 after 65 episodes over five seasons. But it wasn't cancelled because of bad ratings. Nickelodeon just decided that Clarissa was too old, which Kriegman says was very unfair. He thought the show could have grown up with her. After it was cancelled, Kriegman pitched a new series to CBS called Clarissa Now, which followed the character to New York City after she got an internship with a newspaper. A pilot was shot in 1995, but the show wasn't picked up. The next year, Melissa Joan Hart moved on from Clarissa to become another 90s icon, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Meanwhile, Kriegman never gave up on Clarissa. In 2015, he released a novel called Things I Can't Explain, which serves as a sequel to the series. The book follows Clarissa in her late 20s, navigating life as an adult. In 2018, rumors started to circulate that Nickelodeon was working on rebooting the show with Melissa Joan Hart returning to the iconic role. But Hart recently told Us Weekly the reboot is on hold. Now, the show that's considered one of the best, if not the best show ever made on Nickelodeon, wasn't the highest rated or the longest running, but it was probably the coolest. The Adventures of Pete and Pete ran for three seasons beginning in 1993. It actually started as a series of short vignettes that aired between shows on Nickelodeon four years earlier in 1989. It was so popular that five half-hour specials were made, and then finally a regular half-hour series. The concept was the idea of two guys who worked in the network's promo department, Will McRobb and Chris Viscardi. Together with Catherine Diekman, who had just directed a video for R.E.M., they created a show that entertained kids with an undeniable 80s New York punk rock ethos. Viscardi has said that they didn't consciously try to bring a punk rock mindset to a kid's show. It was just what they were into at the time, so it seemed right. Matthew Clickstein says in the early days when Nickelodeon was located in New York, many of the young staffers were influenced by the art and music of the city. You, the people who were making Nickelodeon were working on Nickelodeon by day, and at night they were going to all these different avant-garde theater shows and art shows and independent movie screenings, and they were part of it. They were there when it was happening. And so obviously that's going to trickle into what they're doing for Nickelodeon. A lot of them told me that they were intentionally trying to, you know, proselytize or convert kids into not just the mess and silliness and the reverence, but a little bit of a punk rock ethos. The Adventures of Pete and Pete was not your typical kids show. First of all, what kids show features an eight-year-old with a tattoo of a topless mermaid named Petunia? The show also featured a string of super cool guest stars, including Michael Stipe from R.E.M. as Captain Scrummy and Iggy Pop as Pop Mecklenburg. The music also helped the show develop a cult following with the older crowd as well. The show featured music from indie icons like the Magnetic Fields and the Goth Archies, as well as Polaris, which was responsible for the show's popular theme song, Hey Sandy. Despite its originality, or maybe because of it, Pete and Pete was cancelled in 1996. Ratings just weren't strong enough for the show to continue. Things went quiet for a number of years until the first two seasons were released on DVD in 2005 and gave fans who had grown up with the show a chance to revisit the series. Many are still waiting patiently for season three to be released, which was pressed and ready to go, but shelved for some reason after DreamWorks and Paramount merged. As diehard fans wait for that final season of Pete and Pete to come out, they can at least listen to the show's stars, Michael C. Morona and David Tamborelli, on their podcast, appropriately titled The Adventures of Danny and Mike. While Nickelodeon was developing innovative and fun live-action shows, they were also investing in some groundbreaking cartoons. On August 11, 1991, the network aired its first three original Nicktoons, Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy. 
TV networks tend to go to large animation houses with proven track records to develop Saturday morning cartoons. And usually, they're created with already existing characters from movies, toys, or comics. You know, like Care Bears or My Little Pony. Up until then, the high cost of quality animation had discouraged Nickelodeon from developing original weekly animated programming. But by 1991, Nickelodeon was ready to create an evergreen library that would pay for itself for years to come. To do that, the network created three original animated series that were vastly different from the usual Saturday morning cartoons. Let's take a look at each of these classic shows. First, Doug. The cartoon about a very average middle school kid with a big imagination was the creation of Jim Jenkins. The actor and animator first created Doug as a doodle. He eventually put together a book proposal based on the character called Doug Got a New Pair of Shoes. No one was interested in the book, but the Florida grapefruit growers liked the look of Doug and used him in one of their commercials for grapefruit juice. Eventually, a friend convinced Jenkins to pitch the idea to Nickelodeon, which was looking to develop original animated programming. Within minutes of hearing the pitch, Nickelodeon executive Vanessa Coffey ordered a pilot. The star of the cartoon is Doug Funny, a classic everyman character, or in this case, an every kid. He's been described as a painfully average 11-year-old who muddles through tough childhood experiences like getting a bad haircut or learning to dance, which he writes down carefully in his diary each night. Doug Funny also had some pretty adorable alter egos. Help! Whaleman! Help! Yes! I'll save you, Patty! Give me the girl and nobody gets hurt! The show was set in the small town of Bluffington, which had several main attractions, including Honker Burger, the burger joint where everyone hung out. The world Jenkins built was incredibly complex. He has said the show Bible, which every writer had to read cover to cover to keep the series consistent, included everything from floor plans of all the imaginary community's houses to maps of each street. Doug's squad of misfit friends, along with his crush, Patty Mayonnaise, All have funny names and some have different colored skin tones. Doug's best friend Skeeter was blue. Roger the bully was green. Patty was brown. Another memorable part about Doug was the music. In addition to the catchy theme song, there were also the little riffs that accompanied each character, along with the regular appearance of a fictional band called The Beats. Modeled after British bands like The Beatles and The Who, The Beats were known for their big hit called Killer Tofu, which advocated for kids to eat healthy, though that message probably flew over their heads at the time. That was the thing about Doug. It usually had a little moral message hidden in the storyline, but it wasn't always obvious. Jenkins has said it was essential that each and every installment of Doug taught a moral without preaching. Writers were instructed to annotate their scripts with what lesson Doug and viewers of the show would learn from each episode. Doug ran on Nickelodeon for 52 episodes before it was snapped up by Disney in 1993, going on to become a $100 million franchise with a movie and tons of merchandise. The second original animated show released by Nickelodeon on August 11, 1991, was a show about a group of funny-looking toddlers who go on great adventures with their one-year-old leader, Tommy Pickles. I give you Ice Cream Mountain! Dig in! (laughs) Hey! It's hard as a rock! Maybe it's frozen solid! It's not even cold! But if it's not cold, Tommy, how can it be ice cream? Rugrats was made by Arlene Klasky and Gabor Kasupo, the original producers of The Simpsons. In 1982, the married couple formed their production company, Klasky Kasupo, in their two-bedroom Hollywood apartment. Within a few years, they were working on several notable projects, including The Simpsons shorts, which first aired on The Tracy Ullman Show, along with the opening titles for In Living Color. When Arlene Klasky took a short work break to spend more time with their young kids, she asked herself a question that would be a game changer. 
she wondered if babies could talk, what would they say? From there, Rugrats was born. The show Klasky and Kasupo developed with producer Paul Germain went on to become the most popular children's TV cartoon show in North America and won four Daytime Emmy Awards. The animation of the show was quite distinct. The babies weren't exactly cute. In fact, some might say they were kind of ugly. But maybe they were so ugly they were cute. Klasky and Kasupo completed the initial episode titled Tommy's First Birthday, which aired on Nickelodeon August 11, 1991. It was the first of 172 episodes that would be released over the next 15 years. The show features a gaggle of exceptionally savvy kids. Tommy Pickles, a sweet one-year-old who doesn't seem to own pants. Chucky, his two-year-old neurotic friend. One-year-old twins, Phil and Lil. And a three-year-old bully named Angelica. And even though the show was about babies, author Chris Morgan says there were lots of adult-level jokes. There's an episode where Chucky, the character of Chucky, uh, is talking about the you know Jewish dance, the horror, but he talks about it in the same vein as Colonel Curse from Apocalypse Now, which is a kid I recognize as a reference, but I had obviously not seen Apocalypse Now. My parents were not letting they let me watch a lot of TV and they were very lenient and everything. So I got to grow up, you know, watching a lot of culture, but they were not letting me watch Apocalypse Now at seven years old. Fortunately, that would have been a, a bit much for me. The original run of Rugrats went until 1994. Then the show went into hiatus because of some behind the scenes drama. Paul Germain, who was running the show while Klasky and Kasupo were working on other projects, ended up walking out, along with the rest of the writing staff, over issues with Klasky and Kasupo. And to this day, no one has ever revealed what the problem was. Germain went over to Disney, where he would go on to create the animated show Recess, and Rugrats went into syndication. That's actually when the show's popularity exploded. And following that explosion, Rugrats went back into production in 1997 and went on to become the tentpole of Nickelodeon for the rest of the 90s, spinning off three films, video games, comics, and toys. It finally went off the air in 2014, but this month, May 2021, a reboot of the series launched on Paramount+. It looks different. The original animation style has been replaced by CG animation, but all the original babies and their voice actors are back and they are alive and well, despite a recent fan theory that they were all dead and were just figments of Angelica's troubled mind thanks to her neglectful parents. The third original show launched in 1991 as part of the first block of Nicktoons can best be described as animated chaos. Happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy. Happy, happy, joy, joy, 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 joy. I don't think you're happy enough. Ren and Stimpy, a cartoon about a rage-filled chihuahua and a dumb but empathetic cat, was the creation of John Chris Falusi. He pitched Nickelodeon executive Vanessa Coffey a show called Your Gang, which included Ren and Stimpy. Coffee, who was known for liking weird, out-of-the-box creations, passed on the show Chris Felusi was pitching, but told him she was interested in the dog and cat. From there, the Ren and Stimpy show was born. Chris Felusi, who grew up in Ottawa before relocating to L.A. in his 20s, teamed up with some talented animator friends to establish the animation studio Spumco just a few months before pitching Nickelodeon. Their first big project was delivering six episodes of Ren and Stimpy. The show, with its scathing parody, gross-out humor, and violence, seemed out of place on Nickelodeon. You filthy swine! I will kill you! But its meticulous art style earned the show critical acclaim. The New York Times called it perhaps the most innovative, maybe even subversive animated program in decades. The show was also a major hit with viewers, immediately scoring big ratings. It appealed to kids as kind of a forbidden fruit, and also to adults. In fact, 35% of its viewers were over the age of 18. Ren and Stimpy fan clubs and viewing parties sprung up on college campuses around the country where the show had a cult-like following, and fans turned to internet bulletin boards to share their obsession. But the success was short-lived, thanks to problems behind the scenes. More specifically, Chris Velusi's temper. 
According to a new documentary called Happy Happy Joy Joy, Chris Felusi, who was also the voice of Ren, was known to furiously rip up his employees' drawings and to lock himself in his office for hours redoing already finished work. He became enraged when anyone toned down his over-the-top storylines. When he delivered the first episode of season two, which included a violent story called Man's Best Friend, Nickelodeon executive Vanessa Coffey was appalled and rejected it. She says in the documentary that Chris Felusi told her basically to F off and that he was not going to take any more notes because he made the network and he was the star. The episode in question ended up getting shelved by Nickelodeon. It featured a scene where Ren beats a character named George Licker half to death with a canoe oar. Following season two of Ren and Stimpy, Chris Felusi was fired. The show continued on Nickelodeon with new writers and the animation was done in-house. But in the eyes of diehard fans, it was never the same. Ren and Stimpy was cancelled in 1995. In 2003, Spike TV revived the show with Chris Felusi back at the helm. Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon was strictly for adults. It even aired the band episode called Man's Best Friend. But after just a few episodes, it too was cancelled. Then 15 years later, in 2018, on the heels of the Me Too movement, John Chris Felusi was accused of sexually exploiting teenage girls, promising them careers in animation while allegedly grooming them for sexual relationships. A statement from Chris Felusi's attorney at the time attempted to justify his alleged actions, saying the 1990s were a time of mental and emotional fragility for Mr. Chris Felusi. In August 2020, Comedy Central announced that it has ordered an adult-oriented revival of Ren and Stimpy, but Variety reports the new version will not involve Chris Felusi and he will receive no money from the new series. The person responsible for Nickelodeon's golden age, Jerry Laybourne, left the network in 1995. She went to the Disney ABC network for a couple of years where she, among other things, oversaw the Disney Channel. She then left Disney in 1998 to help create Oxygen Media with Oprah Winfrey. Obviously, Nickelodeon went on without her and created many more great shows in the 90s, including Blue's Clues, Kenan and Kel, and of course, SpongeBob SquarePants, which has reigned as the number one kids animated series on TV for the past 18 years. But it's widely agreed that Laybourne's departure coincided with the end of Nickelodeon's golden era. There's no question that there was something very different going on between 83 and about 95, that just because of the era, because of what was going on sociopolitically, technologically, economically, artistically, it simply was a singular time in the history, not only of Nickelodeon, but in television, in cable television, and really in culture and pop culture and society in general. The next big shift for Nickelodeon came in 2005 when they shut down their studio in Orlando and moved entirely to California. The golden era of live game shows was officially over as the network put all of its focus on animation and live action programs. Today, of course, Nickelodeon is still going strong. In fact, earlier this year, they announced the debut of 20 new series and feature films in 2021 and 2022. They'll air on Nickelodeon as well as Paramount Plus, which is owned by their parent company Viacom CBS. The slate includes several live action series. There's also a dozen animated projects, including the Rugrats reboot I mentioned earlier, and two new SpongeBob spin offs. Camp Coral SpongeBob's Under Years debuted in March of this year on Paramount Plus, and a spin off starring SpongeBob's best friend called The Patrick Star Show has been greenlit for Nickelodeon. If after listening to this episode, you're still wondering about Nickelodeon's place in history, just think of it this way. Nickelodeon, when it comes to content and consumer products, could be the only network that could rival Disney. Of course, there's Cartoon Network and Netflix, but neither of them have been able to reach the heights that the Green Slime Network has. And that's thanks in part to its golden age. Thanks for listening to this look back at Nickelodeon in the 80s and the 90s. And thanks to my very special guests, Chris Morgan and Matthew Clickstein. 
Their books and their knowledge about Nickelodeon were a big help in putting together this episode. I'll have their contact info as well as info about their books in the show notes. If you have an idea for a show, please let me know. You can reach me through Twitter and Facebook at 1990s History and on Instagram at That 90s Podcast. You can also email me at 90s at CuriousCast.ca. That's 90s at CuriousCast.ca. History of the 90s is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, and everywhere else you stream audio. You can also listen at CuriousCast.ca. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. This episode was written and hosted by me, Kathy Kinzora. Our producer is Dila Velasquez. Sound design and final production is by Rob Johnston. And a special thanks to Stephanie D'Souza for editing assistance. See you next time for more History of the 90s.